All right, so uh, the first recording, of course, always fails. Uh, it failed on uh, Tuesday. Hopefully, they, we've got uh, the issues fixed. Uh, but I've also asked them to change the way that the recordings work so that both screens are captured. That's going to give me a little bit more real estate to work with here. Uh, and just so that I'm not a disembodied head, I've, I've brought along a webcam here to, uh, that'll, that'll stream at the bottom here. Uh, hopefully all of that will get recorded. And if it doesn't, then I'll harass them again for, uh, to fix it. But again, uh, understand that the, the, this equipment can fail. So you need to make sure that it's your responsibility that you are coming to lecture uh, and that you're you know, paying attention and that you're watching those videos and doing the required reading uh, along with everything else. Uh, so you already got your first taste of Java in your, uh, in your labs yesterday. You went through uh, quite a bit of stuff. You, you looked at how to do command line arguments, how to set up a brand new uh, uh, project and stuff like that. Uh, basic Hello World program, is, uh, like, like what we did on Tuesday. Uh, and I just wanted to go through uh, some of the highlights that you should have picked up from either the Tuesday or uh, from, uh, from your lab on Wednesday. Uh, Java is an object-oriented programming language, uh, and it's a class-based object-oriented programming language. And for now, the translation of that simply means that everything in Java is either a class, and a class is a special keyword, which is why it's being highlighted here, or it belongs to a class. Uh, now, this is going to be uh, completely different from what you're used to, say, in C, or maybe even Python, or some other programming languages, where uh, everything is hoisted up to the global scope. Uh, that, that is, in, in C, if you were to create a, uh, a function called uh, the, the compute air distance or something like that, that doesn't belong to a class. That's just, that just exists, right? Uh, but in Java, it's different because it's object-oriented programming where everything is an object or it belongs to an object, or in this case, a class, since it's class-based. Uh, classes are simply units of code that are declared in a source file. For example, the example that we looked at yesterday here, hello world.java and hello world, the class name, they have to match. If they don't match like we saw on Tuesday, then you're going get, to get compiler errors, right? If you misspell it or something like that, then it'll start complaining and it won't let you actually compile. Right? So once we fix that, it's back to normal. Uh, the way that this works is, it's, again, it's unlike C, which is a compiled programming language. In C, it compiles it, it changes it into, uh, there are several intermediate steps here, but basically if you take some C code and you compile it down to, a, uh, to uh, say, uh, assembly code, that assembly code gets assembled into binary code. There's this whole process that goes through, uh, and then there's a linker and a bunch of other things as well. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's a bunch of zeros and ones that are intended to be run on your actual processor. Uh, it's compiled for the system. Java is different. It's not compiled for your processor. Instead, it's compiled for the Java Virtual Machine, or JVM. Right? Uh, and and uh, unfortunately or unfortunately, IDEs like Eclipse can kind of hide these details. So what I want to do is I want to uh, open this up uh, on the actual command line here. And let's go ahead and take a look at what is actually happening under the hood, <laughs> at least a little bit under the hood here. All right. So uh, let me just open up a terminal here instead. All right. And I'll bring it over back over here. Uh, there we go. And I'll increase the size. So uh, somewhere on my system here, I've got hello world.java. Right? And in fact, if I look at this, then it's in uh, you know, uh, there's uh, there's the actual uh, there's the actual project hello world two, dot, uh, uh, the, which is what we called it last time, uh, and then under a source folder, under the UNL CSE folders, remember those are your packages up here. Uh, the packages are nothing more than directories where you can store code and organize your code. So I'm going to go up a couple of directories here, and uh, a couple more. There we go. And you'll see alongside of this is a bin directory. So if SRC stands for source, what do you think bin stands for? Binary. <laughs> Let's go into that and see what it looks like. Oops. There's another UNL uh, directory. And under that, there's another CSE directory. And under that is a hello world.class file. Now, that's not a source file anymore. That is actually Java, uh, Java bytecode. In fact, let's open it up and see what it looks like. Uh, hello world.class. Right. So 
If you were to compile a bunch of C code to a, an executable and tried to open that up in a text editor, it's just a bunch of binary code. Now, there's some of this stuff that is recoverable, like uh, you can read a uh, line number table, print stream, and stuff like that. But basically, it is, it, it's, it's binary code. But it's not binary code that is meant to run on your actual machine. It is meant to run on the Java virtual machine. You've got your hardware, you've got your uh, operating system on top of that is the Java virtual machine. It's not a real machine, it's a virtual machine. And the reason for this is because the, the, the design of Java was write once, compile once, run anywhere that you, uh, that you have a Java virtual machine. So it's kind of cross-platform. You can, I could take this compiled code and I could port it over to your Windows machine over there, uh, even though it was compiled for a, uh, a Mac over here. I, and, I, and it would run, and it would run in the same way, as long as he's got a Java virtual machine installed on his computer. You can take it over to a Linux system and it'll run just as fine. Right? That was the, one of the design principles when, they, when uh, who, uh, I think it was part of your lab who created Java. Or maybe it wasn't in the, 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 the birthday of the person. The, the birthday that you used in your lab, I thought, was uh, the creator of Java. Maybe not. I forget. <laughs> Who was it? Does anybody remember? Uh, James Gosling, Gossing or Gosling. I forget which one, which, which one it is. Uh, but he created Java with seven design principles. One of those design principles would be that it was cross-platform, uh, that you can write once, compile once, and you're done. Right. Uh, again, Java uh, classes are organized into packages. Uh, packages are simply directories or folders, if you want to call them that, uh, that organize your code. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's one way of providing organization. Uh, there's the Hello World program that we had from before. And so let's continue thinking about what we see in Java that is familiar. And for that, let me go back to the Hello World program over here. Okay? So uh, say most of you are coming from a C background. What C style syntax do you see? So and one of the other seven design principles that James Gosling put in was that it had to look familiar. And what, by looking familiar, it means that he adopted a lot of the syntax uh, uh, attributes that were, uh, that, we, that were present in C. Uh, what, what do you see similar over here that is in C? Say what? It main, right? You have, um, every programming is, language is like that, mostly. Uh, that you have a main method that acts as a main entry point. Right? What else do you see? Curly brackets. Curly brackets, right? Curly brackets denote, uh, that is opening curly brackets and closing curly brackets, denote code blocks. Right? And they can be nested. What else do you see? Think punctuation. How do you end a sentence? Well, how do you, how do you end a sentence in, in English? You end it with a period. How do you end, uh, end a line of executable code? Semicolons. And executable lines of code. Right. What else? Do you see anything else? What about those square brackets? Square brackets are used for, what do you think that is? Args. Arrays. Arrays. arrays right? As well as indexing of arrays, but we'll get to that eventually. Uh, you have string literals. Literals. There we go. Uh, string, uh, strings are denoted with double quotes. Right? And what, what's denoted with single quotes in C? Characters, single characters, same thing as in Java, right? Uh, we'll get to that eventually, right? Uh, what else? Any, do you see anything else? Otherwise, we'll 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 go along. Uh, maybe maybe we'll uh, we'll observe some other things uh, as we go along. Uh, if you're using a proper IDE like this, by the way, uh, you are going to get good indentation. Because if I, for example, if I just, OK, oh, well, here, back up here. If I want proper indentation, all I have to do is go to the next line, right? And I'll go ahead and restore. Oops, not, not right. There we go. I'll go ahead and restore that. If I go to the next line, it automatically indents. Well, what happens if I screw that up and uh, 
I'm, in, I'm new to code here, say, and I don't realize that that is completely unreadable because there's no indentation. Why do we indent, by the way? Remember, why do we indent? So you can see the hierarchy, so you can see the hierarchy of code, right? Just like in, uh, say, an English outline paper, if you were to write a paper and uh, have, uh, have an outline, then you have main point, sub point one, indented, sub point two, sub point three. Now, sub, sub point, you indent, 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 right? Things at the same level should have the same indentation, right? and everything should be indented to some, uh, to, to some extent, except for the, the, the top of that hierarchy. Okay, well, I've done a terrible job here. I'm going to lose all my points on the style. All right, well, uh, there, all done. All right, what did I do? It was just a quick key. Uh, in this case, on my Mac, I don't know what it is on Windows. You can help, you yell it out if you know. Shift, con shift Command F for Mac and Control Shift F for Windows. Right? It'll automatically re uh, F stands for format. It'll automatically reformat everything for you. Now, vertical white space, it's not going to do that for you. That's a little bit too much. I do like to see some white space, uh, not that uh, white space between uh, methods and stuff like that. You can get it can get out of hand. I've seen people double space every single one. Don't do that. Uh, but uh, the formatting won't care about that one way or another. Uh, again, as long as you are consistent on how you're doing stuff, if you indent instead using two spaces instead of the usual four, that's fine too. If you use tabs, I don't care. As long as it is, a, uh, it is done consistently throughout your entire code base. Okay. All right. So that's, uh, those are some observations that we've already seen. Another, so it's familiar. It looks like C. It's definitely not C, because one of the big differences is there is no memory management. Actually, I'm going to amend that and say there's no direct memory management. Right? Uh, there are, you can have memory leaks, technically, if you, have bad, uh, if you do things wrong. Uh, but at the end of the day, in, in C, how do we ask for memory? What was that function that we used all the time? Malloc, right? How did we give a, a memory back because we're no longer done with it? We we're done with it, we no longer need it. Free, right? That's memory management. Making sure that you free things, that you don't have memory leaks, that you're not holding on memory that you don't need anymore. We don't have to worry about that at all in, in Java. There's no way to declare new memory. The language takes care of it for, your, uh, for you. Uh, and, uh, and what about uh, taking care of memory when you no longer need it? It has automatic, what's called garbage collection. If there is a piece of memory that is no longer used and no longer needed and needs to be given back to the operating system or the Java virtual machine so that it can continue wor uh, working, it'll take care of it for you. Right? It'll collect that garbage and then free it up for you. Uh, in fact, uh, there, are ways that, uh, there are ways that you think that you can force it to do garbage collection. There's system.gc. You might even see this in some tutorials. Ignore it. Uh, you don't need to do it. And in fact, trying to do it, there's no guarantee that it'll actually uh, do the garbage collection when you want it. There's very smart algorithms operating under the hood here. Let it do its job. Right? There's no garbage collection. You don't have to worry about it. Okay? And so there can be memory leaks, though, but the, the, we're not going to get into that. Right? It's portable. You write once, write once, compile once, run anywhere on, as long as you have a Java virtual machine, JVM. Right? It is backwards compatible. Compatible, mostly. So remember when I did a demonstration on Tuesday and the, the, the question popped up whether or not you wanted the module, that, that module creation, and I said, always say no. Uh, that's one of the things that seems to be not backwards compatible anymore. In fact, uh, a lot of the, that, that's because they introduced the package, uh, the, the, uh, the idea of, uh, I forget what they technically call it, but basically uh, only bringing in the packages and only bringing in the Java, uh, the, the SDK that you're actually using. Uh, and that was something that was updated more recently in Java. And so it is, it is kind of backward breaking for a lot of other stuff. But for the most part, they have 
uh, the, the Java maintainers, Sun and now Oracle, have uh, attempted to bend over backwards to try to get stuff to be backwards compatible. Meaning that if you've got 20-year-old Java code that was written for Java 1, it should still compile and run on machines today. Right? As long as they've got a Java virtual machine to run them on. Right? Uh, what about, I didn't do any, but what about comments? You can have single line comments. Single line comments. How do we do that in C? For, oh, yeah, good. Is that a forward slash or a backslash there? Forward slash Y? Because facing right, you are leaning forward. Backslash, you're, uh, you're leaning backwards. Good. Uh, and you have multi line comments. Right. How do we do those? There we go. The, foo, bar, ba, baz. And then star forward slash. Right? And also, something that I tried to uh, instill in people uh, last semester, uh, you can have Java doc style comments. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back over here to our demonstration, and I'm going to show you what those look like. I want to document this class, uh, this Hello World class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go forward slash, star star, and then hit enter. And you'll see that a single line comment is going to be highlighted here in green. I don't know if you can see it or not, but you'll definitely, hopefully be, be able to see it on the video. This is a single line comment. Right? That's being highlighted in green up here. This is being highlighted in blue. And it generated some metadata for me, and it generated all these nice vertically aligned stars. These are doc style comments. I believe it did, be, uh, it did begin in, uh, in Java, uh, and it's been adopted in many, many programming languages uh, so that you can use this style of commenting. All right, so let me, let's go ahead and document this, uh, this class here. This is my first cool Java program. A simple, oops, simple hello world program. All right, done. Right. Uh, for more information, information about me, see uh, HTTP chrisburke.unl.edu. Right. So that's that's a link. I want to actually link link to that so that if somebody's reading my documentation, they can go ahead and click on my website. What is that that I'm writing right there? That's HTML. You can embed HTML directly in your do Java doc style comments. And why, why would you want to do this? Well, unfortunately, you can't see it here. I, I can't blow this up here. But this has been formatted as HTML. And you can see right here this little tiny link. That's going to take me to hey, my web page. Right? In other words, jo uh, doc style comments allow you to create links, hyper external hyperlinks, internal links, uh, for example. Uh, I'm not going to be able to click on that, but if I had more information about myself, C. Burke, then I could go ahead and click on this. Or you could write documentation that says uh, it prints out a string. Well, what is a string? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and, uh, and write it up so that there's a link to that and that, uh, that you can click on that in the documentation, and it takes you to uh, the, the class documentation for that. Right? So it's a, it's a much better way of writing documentation, and I un highly encourage you to get into the habit of doing so. Let's go ahead and document this main method. This main method uh, prints hello world. All right. Now, there's not, this is not a substantial program yet, so it's not going to be substantial documentation. But you can kind of see the, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the advantages of doing this kind of stuff. It takes a parameter, args, uh, the, uh, uh, an, array, uh, an array of strings from the command line. Right. And when I hover over this, I get nicely formatted uh, documentation. And the reason that you would want to do this is because later on, you can actually run a tool. If you've got like 50, 50 classes, you've 100 classes or whatever, and you've uh, embedded all your documentation within that, you can run a tool to produce a web page that looks something like this. Right? Uh, let's see, the, the Java string. Let's just look up the string documentation here. I know this is an older version of Java, but all of this was generated by embedded Java doc style comments. Right? And it's all linkable to each other. There are a bunch of constructors or whatever. Uh, and you can link down to the actual, uh, oops, to other classes, external classes. Uh, and then 
you could see that it kind of looks like what it was hovering over to begin with, right? I'll go ahead and zoom in there. So get in the habit of writing good documentation. Hopefully, you're already in the habit of writing good documentation. Get in the habit of writing well-formatted documentation right? by using doc-style comments like this. Okay. What else is there in Java? Uh, let's see. Well, now that we've got the bare bones kind of introduction, let's talk about variables. So there are several built-in types, but uh, the first thing to realize in Java is that Java is statically typed. Right? And the translation there is simply that uh, in all variables must, must be declared both their type and their name before you can use them. Right? And their type doesn't change. This is exactly like it is in C. If you want to create, an, uh, if you want to create a uh, variable that will hold an integer, you have to declare int x, and then you can set it equal to 10, and you can print it out, and you can change it, and you can do whatever you want with it. But you have to declare it first. So let's go ahead and go over here. I'm going to create a new class, since we're kind of done with this oh, hello world. And I'm just going to create a new class to start doing some demo stuff. Uh, let me go ahead and create. Uh, so I can't. I, I could start doing this, but we're, we're, uh, uh, I could start putting uh, uh, variables directly in here, but then there'll be class variables. So let me go ahead and create. In fact, I'm going to steal the main method over here, so I don't have to retype it. Right? And let's go ahead and get rid of this hello world. So how do I create an integer variable? Well, very familiar. Int x is equal to 10. Right? What else do we have from say C? that we know about that we might want here as well. What other types of variables have we seen? Double, Double? all right. Double pi equals 3.14, 159, whatever. Right. What other kinds of variables? Uh, what? Oh, OK, you can do long, uh, others, long. What's the opposite of long? Short, byte. How, does anybody know how many built-in types there are in Java? Float, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then of course, boolean and uh, string is a. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment here, but string is a, actually a class. Uh, there should be eight. There's four, five, six, and there. That's the one I was looking for that we have in C. Char uh, initial is equal to. There's my first initial. Right? Now, how did I assign each one of these? Well, just like C syntax here. Uh, it, uh, the, the single equal sign is the assignment operator. Take the thing on the right-hand side and put it into the variable on the left-hand side. Uh, to denote single characters, you use single quotes. Right? So all of this stuff should be familiar here, unless you're coming from a programming language like, say, Python. Python is different from both of these languages, both Java and C, in that it is dynamically typed. Uh, that it, uh, you don't declare this is an x is an integer and I'll assign it integers. You just have x is equal to ten, and then the uh, interpreter figures out oh, I assigned it an integer, so I will make it into an integer. Later on, if you reassign it to a string t e n in double quotes here, then it'll say okay, well you want it to it's type to change dynamically to something else. Uh, now, before you go thinking dynamic programming languages are, oh, that sounds cool. I don't have to type int or double or char anymore. And I can make my variables whatever you want. You're opening up a huge can of worms there. Uh, the, 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 a lot of design principles go out. The, uh, a lot of safety issues uh, uh, come into play. A lot, uh, a lot of stuff can go wrong. So it's not, that, uh, it's not that desirable, actually. And in fact, in the most recent versions of Python, you have a static type mode, optional, a static type mode that you can actually turn on, uh, which I think is going to be great for Python, uh, that it becomes sp statically typed, or it's becoming more statically typed. Uh, so long, short, byte, float, those are all, uh, float is just a 32-bit uh, floating point number, so it's half as accurate, it's actually much less accurate than a double. Uh, C has these as well, that's, but I don't cover them, and likewise I won't cover them in Java. Uh, if you need a floating point type, then go ahead and use a double. Right? Uh, byte is a single byte, so eight bits. Uh, short is, I believe, two bytes, so 16 bits. Long is going to be 64 bits. 
uh, whereas an integer is only 32 bits. And so the maximum value is going to be what? Does anybody know it off the top of their head? 2.147 billion something, something, something. All right, that, that'll hold. But if I go up to, say, 3 billion, right, immediate compiler error. And the compiler error is going to tell me something like, that's too, uh, that's too large. That's out of range. If I want something that large, I can go ahead and go with a long. right? And now it's 64 bits, and it's big enough to hold that thing. I do have to put an L at the end, I believe. Right? L, short, uh, the lowercase l indicates treat this thing as a long, not an integer, because I'm going to assign it to a long. Right? But I won't do that. Don't worry about that. If you need numbers that big, there's an even, uh, the, uh, you're eventually going to hit the limit of 64 bits as well. And if you go beyond that, then you need something else that we'll talk about later, a, a big integer. Right? That's what it's called, big integer. All right, and then one thing that you do have that uh, is not in C is a Boolean type. Uh, I don't know, is student. I'm not a student, so I'll go ahead and set that equal to false. You don't have this in you know, down C. You can bring in a library to do something like this in C. What is a Boolean? A Boolean is something that is either true or false. In this case, I'm using it as a flag variable. Is a student, I'm setting that equal to false. I could reset that equal to, what's the opposite of false? True, right? And you'll see that it's hi being highlighted in this kind of magenta color because those are key words. True is not the same thing as true. True is not the same thing as true. It is all lowercase, right? Um, if you're coming from a programming language like Python, I believe true is capital T, R-U-E, and it is case sensitive, but I'm not sure. Uh, but this is case sensitive here, OK? So uh, let me go ahead and restore this back to just 10 so that I, it actually compiles. Okay. So that you have this as, a, uh, as an example, when I post these to uh, GitHub, I'll go ahead and put it over here. Now you'll see that, it's, it, that uh, my uh, Atom IO over here is just as smart as, uh, uh, as Eclipse. It's highlighting everything. There's the keywords are in this kind of uh, dull gold. Uh, these are, this is orange, I guess. Uh, the, the actual identifier names are in orange. And then this is even duller gold for, uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, numerical literals. OK? All right. Now, somebody said something about, well, what about strings? Right? Java has a built-in string class. All right. So what does that look like? Well, if I were to do, say, my name, right, in C, it would look like something like char star uh, first name is equal to, and then I could do this, but uh, that's not the proper way of doing it in C. Instead, of pro the proper way of doing it in C would be to call malloc, set up your memory, then call strcpy to copy chris into, uh, uh, in, into the array, et cetera. But obviously, we don't have that in, in Java. Uh, in Java, we don't have pointers. So instead, we have something much more convenient, just a string. And it works. Uh, yep, there. Now it went away. It works perfectly fine to just assign it. You don't have to, there, again, there's no memory management. You don't have to create enough memory to hold CHRIS. You just assign the value, and Java takes care of that for you. That's my first name. What about my last name? You can do as many strings as you want. And then you can start manipulating them much easier than in C. If I want my full name, I can say, well, um, it's going to be my last name, concatenated with, say, a comma and a space, and concatenated with my first name. Right? So the plus, when used with uh, strings, is concatenation. Concatenation, taking two strings and putting them together. In C. How did you do concatenation? strcat, you had to call a function to do it for you. Uh, or you could, have, you could have done it manually with a for loop or something like that. But you have to, and then and more importantly, you have to make sure that there's enough memory. Uh, second, most importantly, you have to make sure that it's null terminated. No null terminating characters here at all. Those coming from, say, maybe a Python background. What is string concatenation in Python? Oh, we don't know? Uh, no, no, nobody's coming from a Python background? All right, then I won't mention Python anymore then. All right. 
Uh, if my, my memory serves, I believe it's a period, right? No, it should be plus. Oh, it is plus? OK. I'm thinking of Perl, and PHP is going to be periods. There we go. Uh, so you can, uh, you can use them without, uh, w without doing any memory management. Okay. However, strings in Java are, are immutable. Right? Once created, they cannot be changed. Right? So for example, let me go ahead and come back over here. And let's create a string s is equal to hello. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another string and make it refer to s. Now, for those of you coming from the C, uh, C background, what kind of, uh, uh, oops, what, what are you? Oh, no equal sign. There we go. That's what I meant to do. All right, so those of you coming from, say, a C background, what kind of, a, what kind of an assignment is this? What kind of a copy is this? Making one reference, s, refer to, an, uh, 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 to another. So now they're pointing to, this, there's one string here called hello, and it's pointing to the same thing. That is a shallow copy, right? This reference S and this reference T, they're pointing to the same thing. So there's only one copy. If, now in C, it's, so if I make changes and make that a capital H instead, then both S and T are affected. Right? This is a shallow copy. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to make, uh, let's see, uh, S equal to hello. There we go. Now let's print them both system.out.println s, and then same thing for t. Predict. What is it going to print? So the first one should be pretty straightforward. On line 9, I assign it capital H-E-L-L-O. So on line 11, it should print capital H-E-L-L-O. What is line 12 going to print, though? Lowercase H-E-L-L-O. Good guess. Why? And it does. Right? That, that was the correct guess. That's why it was a good guess. Right? Not good guess. I'm sarcastic here. Is it what? The string variable. Uh, the, you don't have pointers, but you do have what, what Java calls references. So they are referring to things in memory. Now, here's S, here's T. What have I done? S is pointing to lowercase h yellow. Right? T is now pointing to that. But on this line, what am I doing with S? I'm making it point to a new string. There are two strings here, one with uh, upper, lowercase h and one with upper, low, uh, lowercase h and uppercase h. On line 9, when I make s point to something else, t is still pointing to that lowercase h. Hello. Right? I didn't change the original string because I can't change it. There is no way for me to change uh, this, uh, uh, this, this character right here. I cannot change that to uppercase uh, h. Uh, if you tried, s of 0 is equal to uppercase h. Something like that, you can do that in C. Because, and you can also do this in Python, because strings are mutable. You can change them. Mutability means that you can mutate them. You can change them. You can vary them. Immutability is the opposite. Once created, a string cannot be changed. And you can see it right here with the uh, thing. It's not going to the type of the expression must be an array of type, but it's resolved to a string. A string is not an array in Java. A string is a class. It's this very special class. You can immediately to a new, which will create a new with capital H, and you're an thing. The reason that you like immutability is because if nothing can change it, uh, if you have a, you have an assurance that it's going to be thread safe automatically. So if you've got thread A and thread B, and, uh, and they're, they're trying to access something immutable, uh, thread A is not going to uh, pull the rug out from thread B. Uh, because it can't, right? It can't change this uh, immutable object here. Everybody gets read access to it, and so you have thread safety automatically from this kind of design. Okay. Those are strings. Uh, let's see what else. 
Uh, here's another example. Uh, let me go ahead and go. Case. There we go. Right. And then let's print it out again. Predict. Did that actually convert the string s all to uppercase? Right. No. Why? S is immutable. Right? And I didn't make s point to a new string somewhere else. So let's go ahead and look and see what it, uh, what it prints. S is going to be capital H -L, -L, -H -L, L O, and we didn't get that. The reason is, if you want to convert something, you have to create a new string. And that's exactly what this thing is doing here. String S T U. <laughs> there we go. And let's go ahead and print out U. Right. Now, what should U look like? This is, this is taking S, converting everything to an uppercase letter, and then returning a new string U that I capture into U and I print it out over here. And that should be all uppercase H-E-L-L-O. Right? So you've got to be careful. All the string library functions, they're going to return new, version, new strings because strings are immutable. Right? Make sure that you've got I pulled it up before, didn't I? Here's the string li library, right? It's just the string class. If you take a, look, a closer look at this, you see a whole bunch of things that you can do. You can get a, an individual character at a particular index. That might be useful if you want to process a string character by character. It returns a single char. Uh, maybe you want to uh, convert it to bytes. Uh, maybe you want to uh, find the first character or a particular substring. Uh, re you can replace characters in a certain, place all uppercase A's with lowercase A's or something like that, right? Uh, but not all, uh, you can split a string. Uh, what did we call that in C? If you want to take a string and you want to tokenize it, we call it tokenization, right? This is splitting it. Uh, in C, we called str toke, right? Uh, in some languages, you can call explode. Uh, in some languages, you can call split. A right? uh, bunch of other things, too. If you want a substring at a particular, starting at a particular index. If you want a substring from a particular index to a particular end index. Right? Lots of different options here. There are dozens and dozens of different string library functions that you can use. Okay? Uh, how do you know if what you need is in there? U R T M. What does that stand for again? Read the manual. Or R T F M if you want to be more vulgar. Right? And I won't be in vulgar here. All right. All right. Uh, careful. Right? Similar uh, similar to C, uh, Java uh, does uh, uh, Java has uh, implicit and explicit uh, type uh, uh, casting rules. All right, and for that, I'm going to come over here and let's go ahead and make some uh, integers, and then we'll go ahead and uh, like integer a is equal to 10, int b is equal to 20, and int c is equal to a divided by b. All right. Now, before I type that semicolon to potentially get rid of that uh, that. Uh, uh, compiler error. In fact, uh, I'll go ahead and do it. That's I could take that code with a semicolon, and I could cut and paste that into any C program. What will it get me? What will what value will C have at the end of the uh, end of all that? A divided by B. Ten divided by twenty is going to be what? Zero. zero. Why? It's going to be zero point five. But because it's an integer divided by an integer, the result is going to have to be an integer. So it takes that 0.5, cuts it off, and throws it away. There's a term for that. What is it called? Truncation. Truncation will happen here. System.out.println.c. 
I'm going to go ahead and run it, and you see that it has 0. Right? Because you cannot have 0 0.5 in an integer. Right? So what's the solution? The solution first is to use a double instead. A result is equal to a divided by b. Is this going to get me what I want, though? Let's go ahead and try it out. The first one was 0. The second one is just 0, 0.0. What was the issue here? Integer divided by an integer. And in fact, I'm surprised there's, there's not, not even a warning here. The issue is that I've got an integer divided by an integer. So regardless of the variable that you're going to assign, it's still going to be an integer result. So what's the solution? To typecast at least one of them as a double. For the purposes of this uh, calculation on line 12, temporarily treat b as a double so that I have an integer divided by a double so that the result is a double. And when that happens, I can go ahead and use 0 0.5. Right? But one thing that is different from c is, or is the following. Int pi is equal to uh, 3.14159. Right? Now, before I put the semicolon there, would this be OK in C? It, it would, but I mean, what would it get you instead? What would pi be now? Just 3 because of truncation. Truncation is not uh, rounding. It's not rounding up. It's not rounding down. It's just simply taking that and chopping it off and throwing it away. Java does not even allow you to do this. The syntax error did not go away. All right? Why? Let's go ahead and hover over this. and. Type mismatch cannot convert from a double to an, uh, an integer. In other words, whereas this is fine in C, you can have implicit downcasting. You have to, you can't do this in Java. If you want this, fine, go ahead. Uh, you can go ahead and explicitly typecast it. I know what I'm doing. Go ahead and force one four one to become an integer so that I can assign it to an integer. Right? This is an explicit typecast. But Java will not let me do it unless it's uh, implicitly. Uh, Java will not let me do something like this. Okay, So be careful. I'll go ahead and pull all of this over so that you have it in the notes when it's posted. Okay. Well, once you've got variables, I already gave you a hint of what we're going to do next here. You have operators. Right? Well, you have the standard math operators, right? So basic arithmetic. Right? What would you want in your arithmetic? OK, I was going to start simple. Plus, minus, multiplication is going to be asterisk, star. Right? And what's the last one? We already saw a preview of it on line 9 there. Division. Right? Also, modular division. Right? So for example, oh, sorry. Uh, 10 mod 3, right? This uh, results in the remainder, right? So 10 divided by 3. Does 3 go into 10 evenly? Nope. Goes into 10 three times. So if you were to write out in school, uh, you know, uh, uh, third grade math, you have a 10 divided by 3, and then you have this thing over here, and it goes into it three times, and then what do you write over here? R1, remainder 1. That's what this result is. It gives you the remainder. It doesn't give you the 3, the quotient, or whatever that is called. Uh, it gives you the remainder of that division. Right? You have logical. What is the uh, single exclamation point? Not negate. Ampersand, ampersand, I, which is going to be, and, and what else? Or, right? good, we said or because we don't know what those things are called, right? Those things have a lot of uh, different names. Uh, vertical strokes, uh, you can call them Sheffer strokes, uh, you can call them pipes, uh, you can call them a lot of different things. Uh, this is going to be a lot or. Unlike C, where Remember C, we don't have uh, Boolean variables. Uh, instead, what's true in C? Well, or what's false in C? Oh, that, that's the easier question. Zero. What is true in C? 
anything other than zero. One is true. Ten is true. Negative five is true. Three. It's all C. That doesn't fly over here in general. That's not going to let me, because that needs to be a Boolean value. This is not a Boolean value. We can now afford Booleans, because we're in Java. Oops. Boolean values. Is student. But one is not true in Java. Nothing else is true, and nothing else is false. Right? So, yeah. Uh, uh, Okay. Uh, what about inequality? Equality operators. How do I test that two things are equal? <coughs> equals equals, right? Equals equals. And so I can do something like int x is equal to 0. And if x is equal, equal to 10, then print out it's 10. Otherwise, else <laughs> not 10. There we go. So equals equals. How do I test for inequality? <laughs> Exclamation, not equals, right? And again, the reason that we have all these things is because it goes back to typewriters. Typewriters were the first input devices, so we were limited to the basic QWERTY keyboard. We could invent new programming languages that used all sorts of uh, of script stuff where you actually have that equal sign with a slash through it if you really wanted to, uh, but that doesn't. Th th that's going to require Unicode characters or extended ASCII characters or something like that, and it's just going to be a whole big mess. Right? That's a, a reason that a lot of uh, uh, even in foreign countries that have like uh, uh, Japanese, Chinese, Korean fonts, they still write their programs without those fonts because uh, a lot of a lot of compilers will will choke on the Unicode characters. So let's run this. It's going to, of course, print not 10. Well, because it's not 10. Let's make it equal to 10. Now it'll print 10. Yay. All right. So equality, inequality is going to be not equals. Uh, what about other things that you might want to test? Less than or equal to? What else? Greater than or equal to? And then. Uh, those are uh, th those are uh, inequality. The strict inequalities would be uh, strictly less than and strictly greater than. Okay. You cannot use equality operators operators on strings. This is true in C too. Uh, now, I, I, I'll still mention Python just to get another po programming language in there. Uh, Python, you can use equals equals to compare strings. But in Java, you can, in C, you cannot do that. In C, how did we compare strings? Is this string content, H-E-L-L-O, equal to this string content, goodbye? No, it's not. How did I do that? STR, CMP, right? String comparisons. Well, same thing in Java. You can't, uh, you, uh, you, uh, if, you, if you use the equals equals operator in C, it'll compile, it'll run, it'll give you weird results. Same thing with Java. String A is equal to hello. String B is equal to hello. Uh, yeah, OK, we'll, we'll go with that for now. Now, is A equal equal to B? Right. Same string. Let's get rid of that. Right. What's this going to print? I might be painting myself into a corner here. Should it print the same string? Should it not? They're the same string. They both contain H-E-L-L-O. Right. Oh, it does in this case. Why? Because that's the Java virtual machine doing some chicanery, some, some uh, weird stuff under the hood. What I'm going to do is I'm going to force it to be right. right? Uh, oops, sorry, new string. 
Are they the same string? No. It didn't print anything. I, I, I should have left, off, uh, left the uh, else statement here. Not the same string. There we go. And let's run, run that again. Not the same string. Right. So the, let me. is doing some optimization. It's doing some optimization that I may or may not want it to do. It's looking at my code and seeing, wait, you got two strings here, both the same content, five bytes here and five bytes here, plus as required for the wrappers classes or whatever. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to create one string and I'm going to make A and B point to it, right? A shallow copy. And so when I asked, are they the same thing? I was asking, are they the same thing in memory? And it was. By doing uh, what I did before, or the second time, what I'm doing is I am forcing create two brand new strings. So A and B are both pointing to different memory locations with the same content. There's two H-E-L-L-O's. And so when I ask the question again, is this the same pl uh, place in memory as this thing over here? Of course, I get an answer of no. They are not the same thing. Right? And that's exactly what I'm, uh, I'm expecting. So the question is, how, uh, how do you properly compare strings? To proper compare, properly compare strings, I'm going to use, uh, let me go ahead and, uh, OK, we'll, we'll do it this way. If a dot compare to b, another string, is equal equal to 0, then I will system dot out. Same, equal, or I'll just print out equal. What does that look like to you? Compare, a, compare it to B. Uh, how did we compare strings again in C? STR, CMP, return true or false? No, it returned something negative, zero, or something positive, depending on the relative ordering of those strings. Apples come before bananas. So if I compared apples and bananas, I would get something negative because apples is in order. A and B, they're in order, right? If I compared, uh, let's see, uh, zoo to apples, they're out of order. So it would return something positive. If I compared apple to apple, then I would get a zero because they're the same thing. Let me go ahead and do that. Uh, with, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and get rid of this. Hello. In fact, let's go with apple. Apple. And B, apple. All right. And not me. There we go. System.out.println. They're equal. Else, if a.compare to B results in a negative value, then I'll say that A uh, comes. There we go comes before, and then concatenate B. Right. There we go. Otherwise, and I'll, I'll be explicit about it here, else if it is positive, uh, of course, there are only three possibilities here. Either it's they're strictly less than, they're strictly greater than, or they're equal. So I don't, stri strictly speaking, I don't need this uh, last comparison over here. But just to show you, uh, uh, keep it consistent, uh, I will go ahead and keep it. Otherwise. A comes after B. So in this case, when I've got apple comparing to apple, if you compare apples to apples, what do you get? They're equal. Right? What if you compare apple to banana? Right? Run that. Apple comes before banana. What if I switch them? Banana and apple. Then banana comes after apple, because it's returning something positive now that this comparison right here will return something positive. Uh, what else could we test here? Let's go back apple, apples. Oops. Which one of those comes first? Apple. It's the shorter string. A, P, P, L, E. Same thing up until the last one over. Now, what would be that last one right there? What would be that last character that you don't see? You would see the null terminating character which has an ASCII text value of 0, so it comes before anything. S has some ASCII text value in the 70s, 80s, something like that. And so it comes after. Shorter strings come first. This is lexiographic order. Apples. apples. Now it's capital. Or let, let's 
Which one of those comes first? Uh, which one? The second one. Let's find out. Apples comes before Apple. Why? It's lexiographic. Think ASCII text table. All the capital letters come in order, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, and then all the lowercase letters come after. Right? If you want to compare, compare to ignore case, Now, what, which one should come first? Uh, comes after Apple, so Apple comes first. One, two, three, four. Nine. One thousand. Or one hundred. Which one of those comes first? 100 comes before 9? That doesn't sound right, right? These are not integers. These are not numbers. What are they? They're strings. So think ASCII text table. ASCII text table, all the numbers come before A's and B's and C, uh, 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 numbers, uppercase, then lowercase. And all the numbers go in order. So it's, I'm doing my comparison here. 1 and 9. Oh, there's already a difference. Which one comes first? 1 comes before 9. So I stop the comparison at that point and say that 100 comes before 9. Right? Even though, because that's because they're not numbers. So you have to be careful here. It's not automatically going to convert over to numbers. In fact, in your lab, I want to convert, say, A into an integer. Dot of A. Y and part. What if I want as a double? Double dot parse double, right? Uh, I can make a comparison. If x is, uh, is greater than y, then print, uh, print f. Speaking of C mode, but you can do System dot out dot print f. D comes before, uh, after percent D and, the, and then X and Y. I think I've got everything in order here. There. 100 comes after 9. Now it's a proper uh, numerical comparison, right? But you cannot do that with strings, okay? All right, so you cannot... Yes, you can concatenate integers. So let me go ahead. Uh, x plus x is this. I mean, mixed kind of mixing thing one way. We'll do it. Uh, what happens is internally the numbers become strings. So if it's a string plus a number. This is going to be forced to become a number, uh, a string, so that I can have string plus a string. It will not be the other way. If you ever have a number plus a string, it will not convert this string automatically. Some languages do that. PHP, for example, I'll be talking about in a couple of hours here, does that. But it shouldn't be, do that. Uh, it's kind of a stupid way of doing things. Not even Python does that, by the way. Python will not have implicit uh, string conversions. It's kind of annoying, uh, coming from Java or something like that, to have to take a number and explicitly convert it to a string. You know, this, this is Python 3, at least. You have to surround it with a uh, call to this str function, force it to become a string. All right. All right. Let's see. So basic. Output. Let's go ahead and expound on that a bit. So Java supports uh, output to the standard output using system dot out, right? Dot, and then whatever else you've got. So you've got system dot out dot print, right? That prints whatever you want, uh, and then uh, you could what you could put whatever you want in there. System dot out dot print ln adds an end line character. And then system dot out. Oops, 
dot printf is uh, uses printf style uh, uh, formatting. Right? So for example, I'm just going to pull over an example here since uh, we've, we've covered uh, printf stuff before. If you've never seen printf and you're coming from a different background, uh, that's fine. Go ahead and uh, read all about it. Let's go ahead and as review, let's remind ourselves, oh, and, uh, spoilers, I've already done it over here. Uh, <laughs> Let's go ahead and review what the, what's going on here. So pi, I've, I've got it out to uh, an accuracy of eight decimal places, right? If I just print it, this is showing up, yeah, okay. Uh, if I just print it uh, using percent %f, f for floating point number, then the default is going to be prints it out to six decimal places of accuracy. Right? Uh, if I only want two decimals of accuracy, then I can do that, point two f instead. If I want 50 decimals of accuracy, I don't even have that answer here because I'm not sure what it'll print. Let's go ahead and go over here to our demo and see what it looks like. Question mark. What do you think it's going to print? Print the. Yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm not going to the next line on any. Let's go ahead and get rid of these two. So certainly a bunch of a bunch of zeros in this case. Now way down at the end, there could start to be uh, be introduced, uh, you know, uh, uh, round off errors and just garbage at the end. But in this case, it actually got all of, of zeros. There, are, how many zeros are there going to be there? By the way, I I did it out to eight decimals of accuracy. I wanted fifty decimals of accuracy in the print. So how many zeros are there going to be? Forty. Or big integer uh, for arbitrary precision uh, math. Right. It's a regular. Remind me how many uh, four bit floating point uh, number, uh, decimal number. IEEE 752 standard whatever blah, blah 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 who cares end of the day how many digits of accuracy does it uh, roughly no remember 16 digits of accuracy so if I tried to go out even further here let's have I've got pi out to I don't know how many decimals of accuracy this is All right it's not going to complain about it but let's see if it matches did it match? No, why? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Wow, dead on, about 16 digits of accuracy. After that, it's all zeros. What if I want a super accurate pi? I would have to do something else. All right. uh, a string. So let me go ahead and copy this. And it'll parse that out. I do have to, oh, so here's my first uh, uh, IDE lesson uh, of, of many. Uh, big decimal, what the heck is that? That's not in the standard library. Let me go ahead and hover over it and see if I can resolve that. One of the suggestions to fix this is to import an external library. Right? How did we bring in libraries in C? Math library. Include math.h. Include stdio.h. Other languages, I believe that uh, Python, I can't remember off the top of my head. Import, import. thank you. It is import. Uh, PHP would be like include, right? Bring in external things. Clicking on this will take care of it for me. Where is big decimal located? In the Java math library. So if I want things like square root, let's, let's compute the square root of pi, right? Math dot square root of, and then the other pi there, int or uh, double y is equal to math dot square root of pi. Right? And I did uh, math, the capital M is in the standard library. I didn't have to bring that in. Math, uh, Java dot math is a different library with more mathy stuff in it, okay? Uh, but now let's go ahead and print this out. System dot, and I'm not going to use this uh, 
uh, this formatting kind of stuff. Instead, I'm just going to go ahead and print out big pi. Right? Oops, not printf, but print ln. There we go. And if I use something, uh, OK. Uh, print n line. There we go. And you'll see that the first one was inaccurate, but the second one is all the way accurate to my last digits, even the 0. It retained the 0. So if you need to have arbitrary multiple, uh, multi-precision stuff, you can do that. In fact, the example that I've got in my notes here that I'm reading off of, uh, I think I grabbed, uh, let's go ahead and, and redefine it. There we go. So I don't know how many digits of accuracy that is, but you can have arbitrary number of digits of accuracy. And when you see this over here, every single digit is represented all the way over. Uh, probably the first 100 digits of pi or something like that is what I pulled. And uh, that's why it's called arbitrary. Now, there is a cost to this. 32-bit integers, 32-bit numbers, 64-bit numbers, those are optimized for your processor. Right? Your processor can actually process 64-bit numbers. Your GPU can actually process 64-bit numbers. It cannot process 10,000-bit numbers or whatever this might, happen, this might be. Right? So the, the, the way that it does it is it does it in memory. If it needs more memory to hold more digits, it will allocate more memory to do so. It'll allocate more memory, more memory, more memory until you've got this big giant uh, byte array or something like that. And now to add two giant numbers together means that you're iterating over an array instead of just doing it directly on the processor. So there is going to be a huge cost to that. There's, it's not going to be w anywhere near as fast as adding two regular 32-bit numbers, 64-bit uh, numbers. Uh, so if you do, I mean, it's better if you, if you don't need more than 16 digits of accuracy, just go ahead and go with a regular old double. Right? OK. So last thing for today is something that we've already covered uh, in, implicitly here, conditionals. So Java supports, in fact, I don't even know if we'll, uh, yeah, Java supports basic if, what other kinds of sta uh, conditional statements would you want? If, else statements, and how do you make it even more complex? If, else if statements, right? like I had before. If this, else if, else if, else if, else if, and then you can op optionally have a, a final else statement. Right? In Java, however, all conditionals must be used with Boolean statements or variables. You cannot, uh, you, you, is this thing greater than this thing, true or false? Is this thing equal to this thing, true or false? You can't have, is this variable that holds the value 10 true? That's C. Yeah? Yeah, in the lab, I noticed that there were some conditionals, there might have been conditionals that uh, didn't have the curly braces to denote their code block. Yeah, that, 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 you can do that in C, too. Uh, uh, let's see. So bad style. Right? Yeah, int x is equal to 10. If x is equal to 10, then here's uh, bad style would be printf or system.out. System.out.println equal to 10. This is terrible, terrible style. Because, oh, and I also want to do something else. System.out.println, um, ooh, <laughs> whatever. Is that second print statement bound to the if condition? Nope, because I didn't put in my brackets. Again, to bring on, uh, get another programming language, Python, perfectly fine in Python, because Python doesn't have opening and closing curly brackets. Python uses indentation to code blocks. In Python, both of these uh, indented statements that are at the same indentation level are in the same code block. Not true in C, not true in Java, not true in the vast majority of programming languages. Uh, I'll keep that good style. Not bad style, good style. Make sure that regardless of how many statements that you have, always of your opening and closing curly brackets. And generally, the, the style is to have the opening curly bracket on the same line space, closing curly bracket on its own line uh, aligned with the I and the if, uh, if, if statement. Right? Uh, that's how it should be done. That's style. Right? 
And again, the, the reason that you fall in, for example, uh, let me. Uh, Colons belong. Save the. Uh, is it equal to ten? Well, it is equal to twelve. Should it print equal to ten? No, but it does. Why? Because by putting that semicolon in there, I'm binding the if condition to not. And then the opening, closing, curly bracket, that's its own block that gets executed regardless of the if statement. So following good style lead, um, it means that you uh, have less of a chance of encountering uh, errors like this.